Psalm 136. Let us uh, read the psalm responsively. Psalm 136. Maybe we'll read it the same way that I read the first part of the verse. You read the second part of the verse, right? Just like the ancient children of Israel have done, we'll do the same. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone does great wonders. To him who made the heavens with skill. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. To him who made the great lights. The sun to rule by day. The moon and the stars to rule by night. To him who smote the Egyptians in, the, in their firstborn. And brought Israel out from their midst. With a strong heart, hand and an outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder. And made Israel pass through the midst of it. He overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the wilderness. To him who smote great kings. And slew mighty kings. Sihon king of Amorites. And Og the king of Bashan. And gave their land as a heritage even a heritage to Israel, his servant, who remembered us in our low estate and has rescued us from our adversaries, who gives food to all flesh, give thanks to the God of heaven. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our heavenly Father, this uh, afternoon, we come to your feet. Our Father, we thank you for the living word that you have given us. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would speak to us through the words before us. Holy Spirit, God, please bless our meditation. Let the triune God be exalted. Lord, give me wisdom. Build up thy people to give you thanks. Bless this time. We pray these things in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The psalm begins with an exhortation. The psalm ends with an exhortation. What is the exhortation? Verse 1, give thanks. Give thanks. Verse 26, the last verse. Give thanks. So beginning to ending, it is, the exhortation is, give thanks. To whom should we give thanks? Verse 1, to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. Not to one another. Not to our spouses, not to our brothers and sisters, but to the Lord, to the Lord. He deserves thanks. He deserves thanksgiving. To the Lord. Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? The Lord Yahweh. The Lord maker of heaven and earth. The Lord the self-existent, self-sufficient God. To Him, we must give thanks. As we look at this psalm, this God has many titles. Verse 2, give thanks 
to the God of Gods. The ancients worshipped these these gods that they made. A man would go into the forest, he would cut down the tree, he would get wood, he would take it to his kitchen, he would burn half the wood, he would bake bread on the wood, he would eat the, the bread, and he sees the remaining wood. What he would do is he would then take this wood and he says, what should I do with it? Well, this is what I can do. I can make a god out of it. That's how the ancients thought. That's how people who do not have an understanding of the true and living God do. They create idols of, out of their own imagination. So we see here, the psalmist is saying, this is not an imagination of man. These gods that you have in this world are imaginations. They are products of man. They are made by man. This God is not like that. He is not man-made. He is the God of gods. He is the most high God. He is the El Elyon God. He is over all that God we ought to give. Thanks. Verse 3, he gives another description of this God, Yahweh. He says, give thanks to the Lord of Lords. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. In case you are you're following the psalm, this is the third time he's saying, give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. Just as today, we have dignitaries, we have the president, we have a governor. Even in the ancient days, there were governments, right? So there were these lords, they ruled over people. But there is a lord over these lords. There is a God in heaven who controls the lords of the earth. The king's heart is in his hand. Like water, he can divert the king's heart whichever way he wishes. There is a God in heaven who has control over the lords of the earth. The psalmist is saying, he is ruler, he is the king, he is the lord over all. To this lord who is, who is the lord of lords, we must give thanks. Verse 4, to, to him who alone does great wonders. Creation is a wonder of God. Creation is a wonder of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. David says in Psalm 8, when I see the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the sun, the moon, the stars which thou hast made, what is man that thou art mindful of him? The God who, through a word, created everything, who alone does great wonders, the psalmist says, to this creator God, we must give thanks. That's the exhortation. Yahweh, to the God of gods, to the Lord of Lords, to the Creator God, to the Sovereign, to this Sovereign who is over all. The psalmist says, we must give thanks. We must give glory. Why should we give thanks to this God? The psalmist answers our question, verse 1. For He is good. He is good. He is kind. He is benevolent. Psalm 145 verse 9 says, The Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over all His works. The 
God, the Lord God is good. He is benevolent. He is kind. He is compassionate. He is gracious. He is slow to anger. He is good. That's why we must give thanks to this God. The second reason, as we see, is repetitive in this psalm. For his mercy endures forever. God's mercy endures forever. Mercy. What is mercy? Many people have many, many definitions. Let me just uh, give you an example to see what mercy is. Turn with me to Mark chapter 5. Mercy, a Puritan um, defined like this. Mercy is the heart of God that pities the misery and the hand of God that relieves the misery. Let me repeat it. Mercy is the heart of God the pities that has compassion over the misery and the hand of God that does something to relieve the misery. In Mark chapter 5 verses 1 through 20, we find a man. This man is, this man is demon possessed. This man was controlled by demons. This man would live among the tombs. This man would gash himself, cut himself with stones. This man would self-destroy. He was a madman. The locals tried to help him. His neighbors tried to help him. How did they try to help him? They said, let us chain this man up with chains so that he does not go live among the tombs, cut himself to death. Let's help this man. Let's chain him. But this, the demon in him was so strong that he would even break the chains. He was in a hopeless situation. He was in a pitiable situation. The Lord of glory, the Lord Jesus Christ visits this man. He heals him. And verse 15, we read this. They came, they came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon possessed, sitting down, clothed in his right mind. The Lord Jesus, in, in a moment, healed this man. He made this insane man, sane man. This man, after he was healed, he wanted to follow the Lord. And this is what the Lord tells him in verse 19. Go home to your people. Report to them what great things the Lord has done for you. How he had mercy on you. The Lord had mercy. The Lord saw your pitiable condition he just did not just pity you but he has done something about it he has relieved you from the misery you and I this morning lost in sin captives to the devil this great God had misery on us this great God has mercy on us and relieved us from our misery the Lord is good his, his mercy endures forever. As we look at this psalm, how does God display his mercy? How does God display his goodness towards us? We can basically break it into three headings. Three headings. The first heading is this. This sovereign sovereignly cares for us. We can glean that from verses 5 through verses 9. This sovereign, this king of kings, this lord of lords, this god of gods, this god who alone does great wonders, this god sovereignly cares for us. Verse 5 says, to him who made the heavens with wisdom. The Lord God made the heavens with wisdom. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. The earth is spread above the waters. 
have you ever wondered why the waters don't cross their boundaries and submerge the earth? Why does the water come only to a, it's as if there is a boundary for the ocean and it comes only thus far and it doesn't cross the boundary, it doesn't submerge the earth. Have you wondered why? We read in the book of Job, the book of Job, this is why. Job chapter 38 verse 8. Who enclosed the sea with doors? When bursting forth, it went out from the womb. Verse 10. I placed boundaries on it. I set a bolt and doors. I said, God said, Thus far you shall come, but no further. Here shall your proud waves stop. The Lord God is doing this. The He places boundaries. He says, thus far you shall come. Beyond this, no, your proud waves cannot come. This morning, if you are living here, it's because we have an earth which is habitable. If the Lord would for a moment remove his boundary, we would be like the Noahic generation. They were under the flood. Truly, his care on fixing the boundaries of the ocean. We see, the, we see his care. Verse 7, to him who made the great lights. Verse 8, the sun to rule by day. Verse 9, the moon and the stars to rule by night. The psalmist is saying, God has put these great lights in the sky, in the heavens. The sun to rule the day, the moon and the stars to rule the night. God has placed them there. What if you don't have light? What if you don't have the sun? What if you don't have the moon and the stars? It's all darkness. Darkness. Life is impossible without light. You will not have day, you will not have night, you will not have seasons. God, by putting these lights, gives us day and night and seasons. And seasons make it possible for us to have physical food. Without light, Without seasons, there is no physical food for us. It is our food we eat is from the sovereign care of God. Now, this is portrayed for us in Psalm 104. You can read the verses when you go home. I will just sample a few verses for you. Psalm 104, verse 10. The Lord sends forth springs in the valleys. They flow between the mountains. They give drink. To every animal of the field, the wild donkeys quench their thirst. What, what is the psalmist saying? The psalmist is saying this. God has put these clouds. God has put these springs so that there is water. This water is given as drink to the beasts. The wild donkeys have their thirst quenched. Verse 12, besides them, the birds of heavens dwell. Because of this water, there is vegetation. There is these trees. The birds live on these trees. Verse 14, the Lord ca causes the grass to grow for the cattle, the vegetation for the labor of man, so that he may bring forth food from the earth. Verse 15, and wine which makes man's heart glad so that he may make his face glisten with oil and food which sustains man's heart. The psalmist is describing the entire ecosystem. He's saying God takes care of the animals. God takes care of the birds. God takes care of the green plants. God gives man for his food in due season. God's sovereign care.
read verse 24 O Lord how many are your works in wisdom you made them all the earth is full of your possessions verse 25 there is the sea the great and broad in which are swarms without number animals both small and great verse 27 they all wait for you to give them their food in due season you give to them and they gather it up you open your hand they are satisfied with good the psalmist is seeing god's care over all creation all creatures you open your hand and they are satisfied with good and so as we look at the first reason first way how god displays his goodness his mercy is by sovereignly caring for his creation the sovereign sovereignly cares for his creation. We have only talked about physical standpoint, right? Physical standpoint so far. The second way the Lord shows his goodness and his mercy is by being a savior to his people. A savior to his people. This is seen verses 10 through. 15 verses 10 through 15 god is a savior for his people the scripture many times portrays god as a saving god turn with me to isaiah chapter 45 going to read verse 22 turn to me be saved all the ends of the earth i am god there is no other turn to me and be saved if you read the previous verse just just a few lines above this verse i am a righteous god and a savior there is none except me Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, there is no other. The scripture, God not only reveals himself as a sovereign, saving, uh, caring for his creation, but he, this, he shows himself, his goodness, his mercy as a savior God. As you look at Psalm 136, verse 10, the children of Israel, here was their salvation stories before us in verses 10 through 15. He's a saving God. The children of Israel were in Egypt. They were under the slavery, they were under the oppression of Pharaoh. No one could deliver them from their oppression. No one. And this is what God does. To him who smote the Egyptians in their firstborn. God sent a man by the name Moses. God sent ten plagues. The last plague is this. God says the angel of death is going to pass through the land. Do this on the first month of the year, on the 10th day, get a lamb. On the 14th day, at twilight, you shall sacrifice the lamb. You shall take the blood. You shall put it on the doorpost. Every house that has blood on the doorpost, there will not be death. There will be salvation. But every house that does not have the blood, every Egyptian house that does not have the blood, the firstborn in the home will be put to death. But if you put the blood on your home, I will be a savior God. None of the 
firstborn in your home would be impacted. The children of Israel do that. They put the blood. When the angel of death passes by, no one in their house is impacted. In the house of Egypt, all the firstborn are dead. The Pharaoh fears. He is trembling and he says, if Moses is here, I will incur more damage. Now, this night, Israel, go out of Egypt. God miraculously, through the smiting of the firstborn in Egypt, saves his people from Egypt. And they, they come out in the, mid, in the night from Egypt. This God who saved Israel from oppression, who saved the firstborn of Israel, is the same God who smote his son, who punished his son, so that you and I might receive forgiveness of sins, might be saved from eternal destruction and have a relationship with God. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4. Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried. We ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Smitten of God. The same God who smote the firstborn of Egypt, smote his only son on the cross of Calvary. So that he may pay the payment for our sins. We may be saved from our sins. Surely God's mercy and goodness are, sh are shown in the smiting of his own son. As we move on, as we see in Psalm 136, not only did he uh, release them from the oppression of Egypt, but this is what he did, verse 13. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder, God's salvation seen when the children of Israel stood before the Red Sea. Pharaoh let them go. They went out. His heart was hardened. He said, how could I let them go? I got free slavery. I got free labor. How could I let them go? He, he gets his chariots ready. He says, let me overtake them. Let me bring them back so I can have free slavery, free labor. The children of God are in front of Red Sea. Pharaoh's army behind them. Verse 12, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, God's power, God's salvation, God's power. This is what God does. God breaks open. God divides the Red Sea so that the children of Israel would walk through that divided dry land to the other side. God's salvation seen in the division of the Red Sea. Children of Israel walk through dry land, through the Red Sea, to the safe haven. To a safe place. Salvation is of the Lord. When we think of ourselves, a similar thing has happened. The eternal fellowship between the Father and the Son has been divided. On the cross, our Savior cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God was willing that his fellowship with his Son would be broken. So that you and I might be saved. Why was he forsaken? The answer is, my sin was my sin, your sin was on his back. That is why he was forsaken. He was separated from the Father. This is how 
God saves us in the separation of the Father and the Son. Surely His mercy, surely His goodness shown to us when the Father and the Son were divided on the cross of Calvary. God's salvation, verse 15, is seen when He overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. God told, God told Moses, the Pharaoh and his armies, you will never see again. I'm going to deliver you completely. You know, if, if, if Pharaoh's army was not thrown in the Red Sea, was not drowned in the Red Sea, there would have been opportunity for them to come again after Israel. There would have been opportunity. But God is saying, no, tonight I am going to destroy the Egyptian Pharaoh's army. You will, no, you will see them no longer. You read that in Exodus 14. You will see them no longer. And thus, God drowns the Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. When we think of ourselves, we were slaves to the devil. You are of your father, the devil. John 8.44 What did the Lord Jesus do at the cross of Calvary? What did he do? Colossians chapter 2 verse 15. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15. This is what he did at Calvary. When Christ had dis disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. At the cross, the scripture is he saying here, the devil and his cohorts have been completely destroyed. They have been disarmed, obliterated. You and I, we have been delivered from the devil. We have been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Turn with me to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. This is what has happened to us in salvation. Acts chapter 26. Verse 18. God is telling Paul this. Paul, I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from, and from the dominion of Satan to God. Dominion of Satan to God. We have been rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. Salvation. Salvation. Where is God's goodness seen? Where is God's mercy seen? Not only in his sovereign care over his creation, but his salvation. His salvation. He is a savior God. And so we see his goodness and his mercy. As we look at verses 16 through 24. We see a third aspect of God. This God who is sovereign and cares for his creation. This God who is savior. This God also shepherds his people. This God is a sensitive, caring shepherd to his people. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah is describing the majesty of God. If you read verses 12 through the end of the chapter, he's seeing the glory of God. He says, who, verse 12, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? He's saying all the waters are in, imagine if God has a hand, right? All the waters of the earth are in his hollow, it seems, are in this hollow, right? This is a hollow. My hand shape is a 
hollow. All the waters of the earth are in a hollow. This is how big God is. He has marked off the heavens by the span. A span is the distance between the thumb to the little finger. What Isaiah is saying is the heavens are marked out by God's span. God is so big. Verse 15, the nations are like a drop from a bucket. All the nations of the earth are a drop. That's what he's saying. So big is this mighty God. And he's contrasting with the shepherd God that God is. Verse 11, like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arms, he will gather the lambs, carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing eaves. This sovereign, this savior is a shepherd. He will tend his flock. He will carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the young, young sheep. This God is a shepherd God. The saints have found this. The saints have found this. Listen to, listen to Jacob. Jacob, uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 48. Genesis chapter 48 verse 15. This is what Jacob is telling. Jacob blessed Joseph and said, The God whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. This God, this sovereign, this savior is my shepherd. He has led me all my life. Earlier we read Deuteronomy 32, 12. There Jacob was in the wilderness. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32 again. Verse 12. Deuteronomy 32, verse 12. The Lord alone guided him. Underline the word alone. A L O N E. The Lord alone, as his shepherd, guided him. The Lord is a shepherd to his people. In Psalm 136, the psalmist is saying, verse 16, to him who led his people through the wilderness, the shepherd leads his people through the wilderness. Wilderness is not a habitable place. It is a rough place. But this great shepherd led God's people through the wilderness of Sinai until they reached the promised land. This shepherd God promises the same to you and me. I will lead you I will never, never, never leave you, forsake you. Turn with me to Psalm 48, verse 10. Psalm 48, verse 10. Verse 14. Such is our God. Our God forever and ever. He will guide us. Forever, he will guide us until death. Just like God led the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land, this God, this shepherd tells us he will lead us to the heavenly Canaan, to the heavenly promised land. Verse 17, 18, 19. 
this shepherd god smote the great kings he slew the mighty kings sihon king of amorites og king of bashan these were nomads the children of israel were nomads they were not trained for war but the shepherd protected his people as they marched through these lands he brought down mighty kings he brought down he protected the shepherd protected from enemies enemies from outside the scripture teaches us as the shepherd god that he is this is what he does to us turn with me to first peter chapter 1 First Peter chapter one verses three, four, five. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to His great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Verse five. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation to be revealed. in the last time heavenly canon heaven how are we going to get there this great shepherd he protects us by his power turn with me to john chapter 10 john chapter 10 verse 28 29 john chapter 10 verse verse 28 and 29 the lord jesus as the good shepherd is saying this i give eternal life to them in other words i give heaven to them they will never perish no one will snatch them out of my hand no one will snatch them out of the shepherd's hand one psalmist is saying as the shepherd god he gave their land as a heritage even a heritage to israel his servant this god leads us as a shepherd to the promised land to heaven heaven itself he is not going to forsake us if we look to him in verse 24 and 25 god shows his goodness and his mercy in disciplining us as a shepherd we are fools we think we are smart so we say i my way is better than god's way and we go astray we are like sheep going astray what does this god do this god intervenes this shepherd uses the rod if you study this uh, the history of if you study the history of the jewish people this is what you will find they settled down in the promised land what did they do i'm going to read from judges chapter 3 verse 7 onwards the children of israel i'm going to read from verse verse 6 the children of israel 
took their daughters, meaning the daughters of their neighbors, these pagans, and gave their own daughters to their sons, and they served their gods. In other words, they turned away from the way that God has revealed in the book of Exodus. They went after these strange gods. They broke the covenant. They forgot God their savior. Verse 7. The sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Ash Asherah. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Kushan, king of Mesopotamia. And the sons of Israel served Kushan eight years. God using the rod, God giving his people over to this king of Mesopotamia called Kushan. Verse 9, when they were humiliated, when they were humiliated, verse 9, when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the sons of Israel to deliver them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz. Psalm 136 verse 23, he remembered us in our humiliation. He disciplined us. He remembered us when we cried out to him. Verse 24, he rescued us from our enemies. That is the God, the shepherd God that we have. He leads us. He protects us. He gives us heaven. When we go astray, he uses the rod. He is a discipliner. God's goodness seen in his shepherding of his people. Verse 26. Give thanks to the God of heaven for his mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. Give thanks to the Sovereign One who dwells in heaven, whose glory is in the heavens. This morning, we must not just glorify God because He is he's seated in the heavens. We must glorify God because He has come down to take us to heaven. He gave us this indescribable gift of his own son. He sent him from heaven so that we may be in heaven. Surely, we must give thanks to this God of heaven who gives us heaven itself. The psalmist says, give thanks. Give thanks to the sovereign. Give thanks to the savior God. Give thanks to the shepherd God. Give thanks to the God who gives heaven itself, his abode to you. This morning, let us give thanks to this great God. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our heavenly Father, this morning, we heed the psalmist's exhortation. Give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord, to the God of gods, to the Lord of lords, to the one who alone does great wonders, to the one who is the God of heaven. We thank you, Lord, that your mercy, your goodness is revealed to us in your care in your saving nature and in your shepherding over of our lives. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for such a good God you are. This morning, we pray that you would help us, each one of us in this room, that we would work out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing your great love and care for us. Help us to continually give thanks to you. 
through Christ Jesus, for this is your will for our lives. We commit all our lives to you. Lord, we pray that you draw us nearer to you. And Lord, use us for thy purposes. We pray these things in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.